Great. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining for today's budget roundtable. Uh, my name is Dr. Derek Little, and I have the good pleasure of serving as chief of staff here for the Cincinnati Public Schools, and I'm happy to engage in this discussion and conversation with you. Also joined by Mr. Mike Gustin, our assistant treasurer, uh, and we, along with the superintendent and the treasurer, are going through these roundtables to really solicit perspective and feedback into our budget development process for next school year. Uh, so thank you again for joining. A little context on how we'll spend the time. First, you see on the screen, you have a QR code and a, a URL address to this slide presentation. We would very much encourage you to pull that up on your own device because there are gonna be some links that we share throughout the presentation that you will want to be able to access. In addition, there are embedded links to surveys and an activity that we want you to do, uh, and it'll be much easier for you to grab that just if you have the presentation open uh, on your end. Has been most helpful is for us to sort of walk through uh, this presentation in this background framing information, then we will open up for clarifying questions uh, to see what we need to go over again or sort of explain differently or address that maybe we haven't. And then there's a sort of budget sandbox activity that we want you all to engage in to start thinking through recommendations and options as we move forward. And then we'll wrap up with some time built in for you to complete the, the closing survey, which is really the way that we get to aggregate feedback across all of these sessions to ultimately share with and inform uh, the proposals and recommendations that the board considers. So let's start at the, the basics. Uh, one more slide, please, Rob. And this is trying to answer the question, what is the purpose of our overall budget? As we think about investment decisions and expenditure choices, what are we trying to achieve with them? And the next slide shows us that that's really focused on our goals and guardrails. So a year ago, the board approved after extensive community engagement, uh, these five goals, which are very ambitious, student outcome focused, uh, goals. So we are looking to improve academic standing and learning and development for our students. So the budgetary decisions that we make are intended to advance our efforts towards these goals. If we go one more slide to slide six, we see that they're also in support of our guardrails. These are values that we want to uphold and honor in the process of pursuing those goals. So thinking about the whole child, how we approach discipline and communication and equitable resourcing, a deep focus on chronic absenteeism, for example. Those are all things that we are now regularly reporting uh, updates on to the board to show how we are making progress towards these goals and guardrails. But that really is the beacon that guides our budgetary decisions. And next slide sort of helps us understand the framework through which we can organize that thinking. For this school year, when we were going through budget development last spring, we did not yet have a final strategic plan. So we base this year's budget on four key focus areas. How do we sustain staffing? Think about continued transformation of our high schools and embedding high quality instruction into all of our classrooms and schools and thinking about equity through focused resources. So those are the four pillars that guided the current year's budget process. Now that we have an approved strategic plan, our five strategies in that strategic plan will guide budget development and guide the decisions and discussions that we have in the coming months. If you haven't seen our strategic plan yet or haven't had a moment to read through it, this is the first place where I will point you to the bottom of the slides and part of why I, I encourage you to pull this up on your own device as well. We have footnotes throughout this presentation, many of which include hyperlinks to additional resources, including on this slide. If you click that uh, blue hyperlink at the bottom, it will actually open up to the page where our full strategic plan is housed. Uh, so you can see that full document, you can read through it, and you can learn more uh, about the goals and guardrails. But as we go through today's budget conversation, and as we go through the next six to seven months of budget development, thinking through the investments we can make to better support our students, equip our educators, connect our community, ignite innovation, and optimize operations is how we want to weigh 
uh, these decisions and these choices. We just covered sort of what we're trying to achieve with our funding, which are the goals and the guardrails. Now we wanna consider how much funding do we actually have available? And the next slide shows us what our financial forecast looks like. The treasurer presented this forecast to the board in early November, which the board approved, uh, which sets the general fund amount that we have available for next school year. That's what you see in that dashed line blue box. $606.5 million is, is what we believe we will have in revenue for next school year. A few things to point out on this slide. The first is if we look at the first two years, we see that the light gray bars, which are what we actually spent, are higher than the dark gray bars, which is how much money we actually receive. So we were spending more than we were receiving in revenue, which means that we were having to eat into our cash balance and reserves. That's what the yellow line on the bottom of the slide represents. And you see that dip between 2023 and 24 in that yellow line because we had to use more of those cash reserves to cover that delta between expenditures and revenue. When the board approved the financial forecast of that 606.5, they did so in a way that says we want to maintain a balanced budget. So we see that next year's light gray bar of expenditures and dark black bar of revenue are equal so that we will have a balanced budget. That enables us to contain, uh, to continue to have a positive cash balance so that yellow line stays above zero, which is really important, obviously, for operations and being able to make payroll and pay other bills. But it's also important because if we went negative, the state could actually come in and start taking over management decisions for the district. We obviously do not want that to happen. We want to maintain basic compliance, but we also want to be uh, with our board, the stewards of our financial decisions. So this financial forecast is really important in a few ways. Two other things to call out here. If you look at the last two years, you see this peach colored uh, aspect of that revenue column. That is assuming that we would continue to receive a current levy that we have, specifically the one that includes the preschool promise. So that is uh, assuming that taxpayers renew that levy and we receive that revenue. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind here is that this revenue forecast is, and we'll touch on this in a minute, is based on only some of our students, not all of them. And we'll explain that a bit more in a second in terms of revenue we receive from the state. We don't have to click on it, but like last time, there is a footnote here where you can see the entire presentation that the treasurer gave to the board uh, on the financial forecast if you want to better understand uh, how we arrived at this. I want to pause for a second and see if my colleague, uh, Mr. Gustin, has anything that you want to add or say related to the forecast. Thank you, Chief Little. Um, no, I think you covered it really well. I mean, the one thing I would say is, yeah, if people want to, people want more information on how we got to the revenue numbers, please, you know, click through. Um, our funding comes, you know, from three main sources. You know, the biggest one is property taxes. Um, the second largest one is, you know, state funding. And then there are some other sources. Um, and then I think you did it covered well, but just in terms of local control, right? If, if our projected, you know, forecast, if our cash balance goes negative, um, the state department of education takes a series of, a series of progressively stronger actions. Um, to force us to balance that thing. And we can't, and you can't use a new anticipated levy as a way to do it. So they basically force you into cuts. And obviously, I think we all want to maintain local control here. So it's important that we keep our cash balance positive in future years. The other big factor in this budget consideration is that we are losing a significant amount of federal funding. So Cincinnati Public Schools, like districts across the country, received an infusion of federal dollars known as ESSER uh, through the pandemic. We got three waves of that, ESSER 1, 2, and 3. We are currently in the last year of ESSER 3 funding, which is important as we think about next year's budget, because that means none of the ESSER dollars that we have can roll into next school year. We either spend it all by June 30th or we send it back to the federal government. On the left, on this slide, we see a waterfall bar chart. 
this year we have $112.8 million in our ESSER fund. That's what we have to spend or lose by June 30th. This breaks out into four big areas. So all the way on the bottom left, you see $12 million in one-time costs. These are projects that we have underway. We only have to do once, like replace a roof or fix a boiler or chiller, and will be done by June 30th. There's another $14 million in projects that are slated to be complete by June 30th. So these are not things that would need to continue into next school year. Part of the challenge we have, though, are the next two boxes here, which total about $86 million. That is $86 million of potential recurring costs. So these are things that we're currently doing now that we believe we need to continue to do next year to best support our students. The problem is we won't have this $86 million to continue to fund those expenditures. So we've got to think about where we could potentially place those costs, knowing that that would then likely have to come from the general fund. Thus, you're starting to sense the budgetary challenge that we have. We've identified 21 of that $86 million as potential costs that we could stop this school year. So those are things that, while useful investments during the pandemic and important, likely do not need to continue into next school year. But there's still $65 million of costs that we do think uh, needs to likely recur next year. At the bottom of this slide, and I do want to pull this one up, Rob, if you'll click on that, we have an Esser Cliff worksheet. This has been shared publicly in every roundtable. Again, you now have access to these materials, and it's been shared in a board workshop back in October. What you see on the top of this are all potential new things. We'll come back and talk about those in just a few minutes. But if you can scroll down, Rob, uh, a little bit to around line or row 17 or so, folks will see that $12 million in one-time costs that I mentioned. So HVAC repairs, boiler chiller repairs, roof replacements. Again, all that's going to conclude by the end of the school year and we'll be fine. But if you keep scrolling down, you can see the $86 million in potential recurring costs. Again, in the, if you look at the very top, you see blue, green, and orange stated columns. The green columns are the amounts of money that we think we could actually remove for next year. So that's the roughly $21 million that we think may not need to carry forward into next school year. What's in the orange, though, are amounts of dollars that we think we likely need to keep. Now, it's important to say now, and I will say again, None of these decisions have been made. So these are all starts to the conversation. They are considerations as we're going through this engagement process. We have not finalized, nor has the board finalized, uh, any of these decisions. You will also have an opportunity to weigh in on these when we get to the activity that you will do uh, in just a bit. But you will find that there is incredible transparency throughout this presentation and throughout these materials. And we wanted to start here by sharing dollar for dollar what is currently in our ESSER funds. So as we think about not having those resources next year, people are really clear about what decisions go into that. I will come back and talk about what the type of cost column means in just a little bit. Thank you, Rob, if we can go back to the slide deck. So the next slide combines these two realities together. Remember, we are planning on $606.5 million in the general fund, and we are losing the ESSER dollars that we have. So if we look in the blue box that's dotted lined on this chart, the taller bar with the blue and the sort of greenish color on there is this year's general fund plus that $86 million in recurring ESSER. So almost $700 million that we're spending in potential recurring costs this school year. Next year, because we'll have only that 606.5, that's nearly a $90 million budget gap that we are facing. So the rest of our focus and conversation today, and really the purpose behind this roundtable, is to get as much input and perspective as possible on how we grapple with that $90 million gap. Next slide, please. So with that in mind, we have to contend with, do we got to talk about every aspect of the budget or can we just solve this in some 
you know, marginal ways. And I, I think you can see by now uh, that we've got to think about everything, but we've also got to take into account that there are things that might could add to that $90 million before we end up reducing that budget gap. So let's go to the next slide. On that Esther Cliff sheet that Rob pulled up for us, you saw that there was a section at the top which didn't have cost in it. That relates to a lot of the things on this slide, which are potential new expenditures. So let's walk through a few of these. We expect potentially next week that our ad hoc committee of the board, which has been working for a little more than a year to think about the future configuration of schools in Cincinnati Public Schools, is going to make their recommendations to the full board. That doesn't have costs associated with it yet, so that may be something that is part of where we go in the future, but first adds to the budget gap before taking uh, things away. And the other thing, just as an example, uh, if we were to provide a 1% cost of living adjustment to staff next school year, that's a $4 million cost. Any other percentages beyond that are obviously a multiple of that $4 million, but we would have to find a way to absorb uh, that cost as well. Lots of conversations right now are related to Cincinnati Preschool Promise. We also start negotiations with all of our union groups for the next contracts uh, coming soon. Those may have additional cost as well. Voters about five years ago in Cincinnati approved a bigger focus on a public safety academy. So if we end up expanding that or considering that a bit differently, that could have cost. You see other examples on here as well from facilities to career tech to even things that may not have been contemplated yet. But it's important to take away from this that these are things that add to that $90 million before we start reducing it. Next slide, please. The other thing we want folks to understand, and this is really a call to action for all of us, is how we generate state revenue, which is based on enrollment. So let's start with the chart on the left, which is a three-year average of enrollment. So each of those bars represents a three-year period. When the treasurer's office and Mr. Gustin and team first started to do our revenue forecast back in May, they used one set of three years. Now we have updated that to include uh, the most recent three years. But what we notice between that grayish blue bar and that orange bar is the decline. So our average enrollment over time is going down and that's what the state bases our per pupil funding on. So that means we are already out of the gate likely going to receive less dollars per student. The chart on the right is how we actually get paid per student. So once the state determines how much money we're gonna receive, they then pay us based on the number of students we actually have in that given school year. So those five bar charts on the right are individual school years. The bright blue one all the way to the right is our current school year. And again, we see that this is trending down, which means that we are getting paid for fewer students. Thus that 606.5 revenue estimate may actually be less in reality once we start collecting the funds. A couple of big important things to note here. One, you see in that bright blue bar, it says about 33,000 students this year. We know we have more than that, but the state only funds us on K-12 students and special education pre-K students. So we are not receiving funding here for general education pre-K students. So that's the difference between the number of students you may have seen us report for total enrollment versus what actually goes into the revenue calculation. Uh, the second thing uh, to be aware of here is if the state determines, for example, that we would get eight or $9,000 per student, they don't provide all of that to us. We only get about 42 cents on the dollar. So 42% of that eight or 9,000, the rest we have to make up uh, with local revenue. And let me pause here again and see, Mr. Gustin, if you want to add or clarify things to that. No, I think you're doing a good job. Keep going. Thank you. All right. So we know that we now got some additional things that could add costs to the budget. We've got some pressures on revenue due to a lower enrollment. Next slide is the other factor here, which can drive costs for us, which is the types of students and the needs that we are seeing uh, in our student population. If we go back to 2018-19, the year before the pandemic, we see that a quarter of our population was either a student receiving special education services 
or an English learner. This year, as we see on the right, a third of our student population is a student with special needs or an English learner. So we have a higher mix of higher need students that require more resources and support, which we want and need to provide to them. That comes with higher costs though. So as we think about the $90 million budget gap from this year to next year, things that could add to that, we also know that we have a student population uh, that is coming with higher cost as well. So let's go to the next section of this conversation, which starts to get into what we can think about doing if we go to the next slide. As I mentioned a minute ago, I think you're starting to see that we've got to now really scrub the entirety of our, our budget and our operations. So one more slide will help us put that into a slightly different perspective. If we think about the 606.5 million that we have forecasted for next year, we can break that up into four sort of big buckets. The first are fixed costs. We'll define that slightly differently later, but for now think of that as things that are required of the district. Like these are costs that we just gotta pay. We don't have much choice or control over. Uh, so electricity, fuel, insurance, those sorts of things. That's $69 million based on this year's costs. The second bucket we see on here are school-based staff. So this is everyone that uh, is staffed at a school, counselor, teacher, librarian, custodian, principal, AP, on and on that list goes. That group of staff is $404 million in our current budget. The third one here is our transportation. And this is just representing the cost of buses, Metro and fuel for the buses. It does not include any staff in the district associated with transportation. That's $47 million this year. So if we say, hey, those three things, we either got to do or we want to minimize impact as much as possible, that leaves $85 million left in the budget. We got a $90 million budget challenge with things that could add to that. So 85 is not enough to cover that gap. So that helps us see that we're going to have to look into those other spaces as well. The thing to keep in mind about that $85 million that remains, those are necessary services and supports as well. That includes things like back office functions, you know, payroll, human resources, other things that we know we need as an organization, including many opportunities and supports for our students. Uh, so we just wanted to sort of frame where we are based on uh, our current year funding. The other thing we want to acknowledge is that the general fund, as, as Mr. Gustin mentioned earlier, is not the only source of funds that we have. So next slide, Rob, will show us uh, our biggest source of other funding typically for schools, which is our federal title funds. These are funds that the district receives to support specific student populations, Title I being the biggest of all of these. But a few quick takeaways. The first is all of our title funds combined are just under $37 million. So even if we could, and we can't legally, take all of these dollars and repurpose them to cover part of that budget gap, it is not enough to fill the whole bucket. I said we can't do that because the federal government doesn't allow it due to something called supplanting. And that means we can't pay for something this year out of the general fund, and then next year ask to pay for it at a federal title fund. They do not allow that to happen. Once we say something is a general fund expenditure, we've got to maintain that expenditure in the general fund. It is things meant for our core uh, work and operations in the district, and these are meant to be supplemental and overlay that. That doesn't mean that we aren't examining these funds as much as possible to figure out where there may be some efficiencies or other opportunity. We just wanted to frame and be clear about how much we have and that they aren't just completely fungible and we can't move them around. The other thing to keep in mind here is they're also currently paying for a lot of things. So many supports and services that we have right now in our schools is being paid for out of these title funds. So if we want to do something differently with them, we then likely have to forego what they're currently doing. Same concept on the next slide, which is our federal IDEA dollars. 
uh, for students with special needs. Here, our total is just under $13 million supporting our students with disabilities. Concept is similar here. You can't supplant, but there's another concept that comes into play with IDEA dollars for special education, which is maintenance of effort. That means if we've been paying, for example, $3 million to support students with disabilities out of the general fund, we can't simply say we can't afford that anymore. We're going to stop doing it. We're just going to use our, our IDEA funds. We would no longer be maintaining our effort and that could put our IDEA funds in jeopardy. The federal government could actually penalize us or take some of that funding away. So this isn't an immediate, hey, let's just reduce what we have in the general fund because we can use these dollars because that's not allowed federally either. And just like with title funds, all of these dollars are currently paying for supports and services as well. So if we reallocate them, we have to possibly forego what they're currently doing. So let's get into the last real chapter here which is how we can think about the different building blocks of the budget and how we start to prioritize and make decisions around them. So next slide, please, Rob. What we have tried to do here is categorize the budget in a way that clarifies a few things. One that clarifies generally what it's intended to do, so the type of cost that it is, but also indicate how difficult it may be to change that type of cost. So on this slide, you see a gradient sort of from orange to green. The four costs on the far left, CBA formula costs all the way to foundational, those are the hardest to change costs that we have. And in some cases for fixed and foundational may not be able to be changed at all. Uh, as a reminder, CBA stands for Collective Bargaining Agreement. That represents what we've negotiated across all of our union groups. And there are specific formulas in some of those agreements for how many staff we provide to classrooms and schools, either based on class size or size of building, enrollment, something like that. If we go to the far right, we see that there are three costs on the green side of this spectrum, supplemental down to enrichment. Those are the easiest types of things to adjust because we have full sort of district discretion over them. They're not negotiated. They're not something that is uh, necessarily a board approved item. So we could change those things rather quickly and easily. But let's remember, this is not an indication of how much we think these things should be changed or how painful it would be to change them. This is just an indication of the modification process itself. And then the three in the middle sort of land between the two. At the bottom of this slide is possibly the most important link in this presentation. And if we can open that up, Rob, I will I'll walk some folks through it. You will want to refer to this more later. You will possibly want to study it uh, on your own time. But this is where we unlock and show the entirety of our current year budget. So of our current year budget. So every single dollar that we have this year uh, is accounted for in this workbook. The first tab that we see when we open it up is definitions of each of these types of costs. So we have defined them in the middle. So you see that. So let's take CBA formula costs, for example. That's a cost, as I, I said earlier, is something that's based on a staffing formula in one of the bargaining agreements. That is the hardest to change cost. So that's labeled as orange because we can't do anything with it without agreement from our unions. And as I mentioned earlier, we're about to enter negotiations with all of our union group for new contracts. So anything that's negotiated has to go through the negotiation process. If we look at one of the yellow ones, we see core operations on here as an example. Those are things that are really central and pivotal to the work that we do as an educational institution. So we may have some flexibility here, thus it's yellow and not orange, but not a ton. And some of those things may even be uh, required or only able to be adjusted uh, in more moderate ways. Then we've got some green examples, and we'll look at district-created formula as that one. 
these are things that we decide on our own. They're not in a, in a negotiated contract. Uh, they are under our discretion. Examples of that, uh, number of custodians per school, number of security assistants per school, number of APs, and, and that example list goes, goes on as well. So all of that could be modified. But as I mentioned earlier, these are not things that you necessarily want to go to first. We've got to weigh that across, again, our path to the goals and guardrails and what potentially will best set us up in the future for supporting our students. So the color coding here, remember, is just a description of how it gets changed, not whether it is the most preferred thing to change. If we can go to the second tab, Rob, the budget blocks worksheet, this is where folks can see all of the budget. So we've got part of the bu budget block labeled in column A. We see board office as the first row, the amount of money associated with that. In the other notes, we break down that amount of money. So you see how that 430,000 actually splits out into staff, office costs, overtime, et cetera, and the type of cost that it is. So that's a board discretion cost in yellow. If you'll scroll down some, Rob, let's look at school-based instructional staff. We see that's a giant number, $222 million, as we would expect it to be, because that's most of what we do, which is supporting students in the classroom. You see all of the titles, um, vast majority teacher titles, associated with that $222 million. That is a CBA formula cost, so it is red which means we can't change what goes into that calculation without negotiating something different. Folks have this, you can scroll through it, you can see the different types of costs, what makes up core versus supplemental. You can look at the various enrichment costs and fixed costs here, and that adds up to our total budget number for this current school year. If we can now go back to the slide presentation. Thank you, and let's pause on this slide. So if we take into account those types of costs, we can then show how much money is in each type. So the orange, remember the most difficult to change, that's about $400 million of our current budget. The green, the easiest to change, is about 95, which is roughly 15%. Now, like on a slide earlier, we could just say, okay, get rid of that $95 million. But as you're looking through that list, I am certain you have already found things in that 95 that you would say, we just can't live without or our students have to have that. The pie chart on the right shows you the breakdown of all of the costs. You see the, the biggest one here is our CBA formula costs at roughly half the budget, followed by core operations next, all the way down to types of costs that are even less than 1%. But again, you've got those dollar amounts and you can look at that uh, through the spreadsheet we just pulled up. So with all of that said, let's go to the next slide. We about two months ago asked all of our central office teams to pursue a 15% budget reduction in their general fund and ESSER dollars. Uh, we did that to understand what those reductions may look like and to know how much in total that might generate to be able to be reduced from our budget. That was a, a difficult, it was a painful process. And what we found is that through that, many teams struggled to get to 15%. And as a district, we only got to just under $10 million. We don't have enough of those $10 million chunks to make our way to the full 90. So we gotta think about bigger things here as an organization. Are there things that we strategically abandon? Maybe there, there are things or programs that we've been doing, but in, in pursuit of those goals and guardrails and in light of the resources we have, they just aren't going to create the most return on investment. Are there programs that we need to consolidate or policies that we need to reconsider? Transportation is the biggest example of that. Uh, we know that we go well beyond the state minimums. And as you saw earlier, we're spending $47 million on buses and fuel alone. It is also helpful to remember that roughly a third of that total budget for transportation is for us to transport students to non-public and charter schools as we are required to do. So this is where we want to get you thinking about how you would make choices here.
in responding to and resolving this budget challenge. So let's look at the next slide to, to sort of frame what some of those options may be. We have, as a team, started to look at various things which we might could think about differently, some of those big ideas. This slide labels those based on whether they're big ticket items, so they might contribute more than $5 million, whether they're medium ticket and they might be in the $1 to $5 million range. Note that that bucket of medium ticket items is mostly in ESSER right now. So if we don't reduce those, we then have to find a home for them in the general fund next year. And then some smaller ticket things. But as I just said, the smaller ticket things are not going to be adequate uh, to get us there all the way. The next slide prices some of these for you so you can see what potential reductions would look like. I want to call a few of these out that have been discussed pretty heavily uh, in prior roundtables. We'll start with super sub allocations in the second row. In the beginning of the pandemic, the district started providing dedicated substitutes to schools. So rather than just calling somebody to come in when a teacher was absent, we allocated a substitute that could be at that same school every day, all day. If we were to stop doing that and just go back to daily substitute coverage, that could help us reduce $4.3 million. That's currently an ESSER, but it still contributes to that $90 million. I want to go down the slide a bit to the one-to-one -one devices. We started in the pandemic providing one-to-one -one devices for all students. If we were to rethink that in grades K-6, so no longer would you have a one-to-one -one device, but we would have adequate devices in the school. So in every core content classroom, for example, there was a class set so students could use the technology as they needed to. That could save $2 million uh, out of the gate. You see other things on here as well as potential things to talk about and consider. And obviously there's a lot of other things which you may come up with as well. But what we want you to do now is take about 10 minutes. You've seen the presentation, you have access to it, you have access to the budget sandbox. And we want you to go to this link, which you can do through the QR code or the URL, and it will open a very simple Google form. That Google form asks you to tell us what type of cost, whether that's in general fund or ESSER right now, that you would start to make reductions in. Once you pick the type of cost, like core operations, it then opens up to all the types of core operations, and you can indicate which one you want to choose, how much you re would reduce, and tell us why. This has been really helpful. Uh, folks who've engaged in this thus far have thought this was a really uh, helpful way to sort of force some thinking around the budget. Uh, before I describe the survey on the slide, I want to say that there are quite a few slides after this that you have access to in the appendix, uh, which you can look at at your leisure that provide a bit more detail into those types of costs. We also show the range of you know, potential reductions and additions with class size changes. That's been something folks have asked about, so we wanted to, to make that available so you could see what it would cost if we reduce class size or what we could potentially save if we increase class size. But what we really need everyone to do is to complete this survey. What you just did in that sandbox uh, was really important and that gets you thinking and, and sort of understanding the real challenge that we face and even trying to find $10 million, much less 90. But this survey is a bit more holistic and a bit more comprehensive and will help us understand how we prioritize decisions as we move forward. All right, thank you all again for joining. Uh, please get your, your survey submitted and in. If you want to join a future session, we look forward to seeing you then and really appreciate you making the time today. So hope you all have a great rest of your Friday and a really great weekend. Thank you and bye-bye.